Okay, so Mavis Staples, before she starts singing Eyes on the Prize uh, in her live album, Hope at the Hideout, says, we've come here tonight to bring you some joy, happiness, inspiration, and some positive vibrations. And we want to leave you enough to last you for the next six months. <laughs> and seeing your play was like that for me. Oh, I, bless you. It really was. It's like I've been hyped for like four months oh, straight. Man, you just won my heart just by quoting Mavis Staples. Oh, my goodness. How great. I was listening to the album recently, and I was like, that is what Hamilton is like for me like it just gave me I don't know just like energy and hope and nourishment for just ever since I saw it oh, so it completely so blew me away and that's what great art I believe should do so it's been like this phenomenon in my life <laughs> anyway I'm gonna stop fangirling on you but um please don't no <laughs> okay I'll sustain it a little yeah. bit but we'll, we'll so we were, we were doing this thing with the public theater and we were in New York for um, the great Oscar used just yes, yes and uh, for International Women's Day and so it just seemed perfect to talk to you about the play so thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so for those of us that aren't lucky enough to be in New York here to see the play, and it's almost impossible to get a ticket yes. at the moment, could you give us like a 30 seconds, like highlight reel synopsis? Yeah, sure. Um, Hamilton is the story of our first, our nation's first treasury secretary, and it's as sexy as it sounds. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation, every action to act the creation. I'm laughing in the face of casualties of sorrow. I'm thinking past tomorrow. <laughs> it's about Alexander Hamilton. He's the dude on the $10 bill um, who had an amazing, tumultuous, unlikely American life. And I knew nothing about him until I picked up Ron Chernow's uh, biography of him one day on vacation and uh, just felt like it was the proto-American immigrant story. Before there was an America, this guy sort of came here for a better life and managed to make one. Um, it's also, uh, um, in a weird way, a love letter to writers. This is a yes. this is a guy who wrote his way out of his circumstances, wrote his way into power, and also wrote his way to ruin, blew up his own spot, um, yeah. and caught beef with all the other founding fathers. And and the music I use is. Um, all the music I can get my hands on. Yeah. So it's hip-hop music, and it's R&B music, and it's Beatlesque music for King George. Yeah. Um, but it's um, our goal is to eliminate any distance between a contemporary audience and this story that happened over 200 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why people are so psyched uh, about Hamilton, is that you just kind of blast through every expectation and tradition. You know, you use music that would be seemingly incongruous with the time, but that is so perfect as a way to express these ideas yeah. and like and structurally I steal a little bit from Harry Potter I have to tell you what because um, no. the opening scene Hamilton meets Aaron Burr uh, and he says Aaron Burr like help me like I want to be in this world uh, and Burr gives him the opposite advice of who he is right. and then he meets his real friends uh, yes. Mulligan Lafayette and uh, yeah and right. uh, and Lawrence and it's exactly <laughs> it's exactly, exactly Harry Potter meeting Malfoy yeah. first and then seeing his real friends on the train being I like, I like these guys better. I completely forgot that because in the first <laughs> book, Draco tries to be like, you know, I can help you. I can help you. Like, just, tries to befriend consort with him. the right people. And, and Harry has this instinctual, like, this guy is clearly an asshole yeah. and I have to. Yeah, everything I learned, I learned from, from those him. books. <laughs> yes! This is great. Harry Potter's everywhere. It's the yeah. ultimate universal story. Um, okay, good. So, yeah, so you wrote this play. Which is set how many years ago now? Uh, he was born in 1755. We go all the way through his set life till his death in 1804. Told with cont with contemporary music, with all different kinds of music, but it's also been kind of there's been this amazing response to it because you cast a multiracial cast in the roles of you know who would traditionally yeah. have been white men. Um, so I'm really interested. You kind of really have broken the mold. Did, did this just kind of like flow naturally from you as a person and an happened, artist or was this Yeah, it happened very, very organically. You know, I got to this end of uh, the second chapter in this book. Um, I get to the part where he literally writes an essay and gets himself out of the Caribbean. Um, and I said, this is a hip hop story. So even in my first read through of the biography, I was casting hip hop and R&B artists in my head. I was never picturing the literal founding fathers. We know what they look like. Like, right. it takes exactly no research yes. to find out what the Founding Fathers actually look like. You just open your wallet. Right. Um, so the fun for me was in, all right, well, which 
R&B artist, hip hop artist, music artist has the feel of the the temperament. So, you know, with George Washington, I was thinking about Common and I was thinking about John Legend. And that's a, actually a pretty good description of Chris Jackson, who plays him um, with uh, when I read the name Hercules Mulligan, I thought that's the most Busta Rhymesian sounding such rapper a name. name. It is like, such a great so name. So good. So I, you know, I wrote it as if Busta Rhymes was in my head. And so Tommy Kale just sort of took that and extended it and really said, you know, this this conceit just allows us to eliminate the distance even more because if it doesn't look like a John Trumbull painting mm -hmm. um, from the 1700s, then we can identify, we can find our way into it yeah. in a way that makes it much more accessible than if it was just sort of a, you know, a period piece. Totally. Well, again, that was what was so cool is that, you know, set hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but I kept seeing our times, topical issues that I was seeing in the news, right. just so reflected in what I was seeing yeah. on stage. And that's what I found love with when I was writing it too. I was like, oh, we've been fighting about the same things forever. forever. It's no accident that we're still fighting about how much is the government involved in our lives, yes. which is what Jefferson and Hamilton rap battle about in my show. Yeah. It's no accident. We still fight about how involved do we get in the other countries' uh, affairs, yes. which yes. is, you know, in our rap battle, it's the French, it's the French yeah, Revolution, the French Revolution, but is still just applicable to any any foreign venture uh, the United States has, um, and it's also no accident that. Um, Everyone who dies in our play dies as a result of gun violence. Yes. <laughs> That's the other thing that um, is it's is so is in the founding of our constitution that we can't seem to get right. Yeah. Um, but is you know plagues even our show, much less yeah. our country. Yeah, and also who's an American? Who gets to live here? Who's yeah. a true American? What does that What does that mean? Absolutely. Um, all of that stuff. I was so. I was like, wow, this has everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jefferson was using immigrant as a way of denigrating Hamilton way before Trump ever <laughs> entered ever the scene. Ever came anywhere near any of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. It was, it's so great. It's difficult for me, obviously, not to look at it through the lens of he for she and the work that I'm doing and, you know, Angelica and Eliza, uh, sorry, Angelica and Eliza and the, the sisters are, you know, clearly amazing for that. I'm trying to find, oh yeah. So she says, uh, Angelica raps, you want a revolution, I want a revelation. So listen to my declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And when I meet Thomas Jefferson, I'll uh. compel him to include women in the sequel. Work. It's so good. <laughs> I love it so I much. I just pictured a million teenagers see... making gifts of that moment. No, <laughs> me rapping? Yeah. Yes. Oh, God. It's the it's, best. I am <laughs> so not a rapper, but it makes me want to learn to do it because she's so badass and it's she such is. an amazing way she to... Is. And she was. Express ideas. Yeah, and you know, I think um, one of the sort of the things that, that Ron writes about in his book that I sort of uh, expand in the show is this notion that if Angelica Schuyler lived in a different time, she'd be one of our founders. Totally. Um, and, you know, she meets everyone who met Hamilton and Angelica together thought, well, they're the married couple, right? Because yeah. they were so. Well, they, were, they were They were intellectual soulmates. Soul yeah. And the letters they write back and forth, I mean, he, you know, she's desperate for news. She's in London. Yeah. And she, she she married a rich British banker, moved to London, and her her letters she writes she actually also corresponded with Jefferson. Um, really? Yeah, and it's actually pretty amazing because Jefferson's trying to flirt with her, and she's not having, having any it. Of it. He's like, you know, we should. He's in Paris while she's in London, and he's writing her this letter to the effect, if I'm paraphrasing, he's like, yeah, we should go to America together. We could like take the boat over together. And and, she's and like, Angelica goes, oh yeah, that sounds really nice, except there's uh, uh, I, my, my loyalties lie elsewhere. Basically, like she, yeah. oh she's God, like, doing... hashtag Team Hamilton. Hashtag, I'm on somebody else's yeah. team. Uh, so she did meet Jefferson. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's so, she's so cool. Um, so I'm interested, though, because you've, like, you've included these really, really political things in your play. And I'm interested, do you think that storytellers have a responsibility to drive us forward as a society, to encourage us to perceive things in new ways? And if you do, does this ever weigh like heavily on you? Do you ever feel like... Do you ever feel like that's a responsibility? No. I'll tell you the way I think of it. I think 
storytellers can't help it. Your worldview affects what you see in the work and right. it affects what you make. Right. Um, anything that's political in Hamilton's story is inherent in Hamilton's story, at least the way I, I know it. how to tell it. Yeah. Um, and so I think the thing, you know, the, the notion of Hamilton as an immigrant story, it, it, maybe another writer would not have seized on that as the through line. That yeah. was definitely my way in. Yeah. Um, you know, having um, parents who were not immigrants, they were born in Puerto Rico. They came to New York. Um, you know, my dad didn't speak a word uh, of English when he came here and he came here to, to get a better life. So I, I'm familiar with that story, that right. immigrant narrative of like, we're going to come here and we're going to do the jobs no one else wants to do and we're going right. to work twice as hard. Right. Um, and I recognize that in Hamilton. Right. Um, so that's what comes out when I write him. Someone else may have a totally different version, but I really try not to think of writing as a burden at all. My job is to fall in love because it's got to sustain me. This show took six, seven years to write. It's got to sustain me yeah. for six, seven years. And so, um, you know, the, 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 politics inherent to the show are just what come out of me when I write about this thing. And, um, and it's also, but it's, it's really about being inspired and being in love. Like there are a million biopic, right. bio musical worthy subjects, yeah. but if I don't know the way to tell it, I can't tell it. So yeah. if it starts to feel like a responsibility and it feels like homework, I mean, I know you love homework. I, I love homework. I don't I love homework. homework. I need it to feel like a love affair. It yeah. can't feel like homework to me. No. Um, but that's sort of how I approach it. So kind of what you're saying is that art is is just incredibly personal. It's just like everyone will yeah. read the same thing a different way, will experience yeah. it differently. And, and I think the, the ultimate way in which art can be political is that I think it engenders empathy, which is the thing that politicians can't seem to they do. They can't do, yeah. it's, it's, oh, if you feel like you know someone because you've spent two hours chronicling their life in a story or you've seen some movie that gets you under their skin and in their heart like yeah. you can't dismiss them as other anymore no do you know you what can't. i mean you it's so true i talked about this yesterday when i was talking to forrest whisker just saying that like once you've seen a movie that has just opened you up to some to somebody else or in a different perspective you can't unsee it that's right that's it you're done that's you're right. changed forever you can't go back it's yeah. you're changed yeah. and that's what's so amazing about art and yeah. movies and plays and things.